Wow, that's a lot of text. I hope there's not going to be a test on it. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's We're talking about history now, how the game got started, uh, and there are, are some uh, important moments. The, the key thing to think about as a memorabilia collector is you're, you're not going to be too uh, concerned. Too much, you're not going to be that concerned about the history of the sport, but it's good to know. The sport started in the mid 19th century. Uh, the modern version of the sport with the modern rules started in England, uh, and then it spread around the world via colonialism. Uh, in America, it started with immigration, to, primarily to the Northeast, immigrants from Europe, and then from South America and the Caribbean. Um, and the first uh, American clubs were made up of immigrants. They were uh, immigrant social clubs, and primarily from Scotland and the UK, and then from the rest of Europe and, and from different places around the world. There were some very successful teams in America. Uh, we have Sport Club Yo, which is a sports club, is a sports club uh, in Brooklyn, and they won. That team won the 1954 national championship. Uh, they play these. Some of these teams played in front of their own fans, their own stadiums. Uh, they had their own following. It's important to remember this, uh, just so you can put it into perspective. Uh, that a lot of what we see today with um, the friendlies and, and teams coming over here from Europe or South America to play friendlies. None of this is new. Uh, teams were playing, uh, European teams were coming over here the turn of the century even before playing friendlies. In some cases playing in front of thousands of people at stadiums. None of that is new. Um, playing in baseball stadiums, um, Italian teams coming and playing at Ebbets Field. Uh, this has been happening for a very long time. So there's nothing new to this. It's important to know your history. They say the old cliche, the old adage is that um, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. So it's important to know your history and also to know what's been done um, how to, so you know how to improve things. Um, the United States shocked the England in the 1950 World Cup. Um, and that from then, from that on, it could have been a turning point where soccer could have grown, but it, it didn't because there, was no, there wasn't really much exposure. Uh, it wasn't televised in the States. Uh, and that sort of doomed soccer in the States because of the lack of television coverage, the lack of a national professional league, the all regional leagues, and the rise of traditional American sports, such as baseball. Baseball had its best decade ever. Um, baseball expanded out west. Uh, the NFL became more popular. Basketball became more popular. And television really fueled the rise of that. Children of immigrants were no longer interested in playing um, playing soccer, they wanted to assimilate and play American sports. Uh, a lot of immigrants moved out to the country where they could play American sports. It became soccer became um, it began to be seen as more of an immigrant sport, uh, as, as a prep school sport in New England, uh, sort of a niche sport. Uh, and uh, Americans started started attaching a stigma to playing and following the sport a little bit that lasted for for a number of decades and in some cases less. Uh, even today. So I just want to get one thing out of the way is, as I, I mentioned in the previous uh, podcast, why do I refer to it as football? And then why do I switch back and forth in soccer? And I, I, I briefly explained why, but why do we call it soccer in America? Why do they call it soccer in Canada, uh, in New Zealand and in, um, in Australia as well? And there are reasons. Uh, historical reasons why, primarily because in these countries there was two there was two types of football. There was association football and rugby football. And we in the United States and Canada we have a version of rugby football, and that version is American football. That is a version of rugby. It is a modern version of rugby. It came from rugby, um, just as baseball is in some ways a version of cricket. It is a bat and ball sport that came out of cricket. Um, so in these areas, uh, it just so happened that rugby football became much more popular than association football. And so rugby was dropped and, you know, and then in different countries, the name was changed. In some cases, rugby still became popular. And then there was another version. There's Aussie rules football and the America, America, we just call it football, but essentially it's the same idea. Association football became less popular. The nickname at the time, there was a nickname going around, mostly in America, not so much in England. There was a, a nickname, and the nickname for association football was soccer. You could see association, you're not gonna call it, hey, you wanna go play association? No, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna, play, I'm gonna go play rugby football. 
So they called it soccer and it was a nickname. Well, the nickname was sort of a tongue in cheek nickname uh, in, in England. It was never really taken that seriously. But in America, we took it seriously and we used it to identify association football. So that's out of the way. That's why we call it soccer. Soccer stuck because American football, because of uh, rugby football, and the modern version of rugby football became very, very popular. And that's why we call it soccer. Okay, that's out of the way. So in the 1950s, soccer experienced a, a pretty big decline. And by the 1960s, immigration, by early 1960s, immigration had slowed down considerably. It wasn't until the mid 1960s that we started seeing more and more immigration. And that had to do with legislation, uh, a lot of things happening in the States, uh, demographic uh, changes, uh, social changes, social upheaval. Um, the country changed a lot in the 1960s. Uh, the norms and the accepted values uh, were thrown uh, were thrown around a little bit, and by the 1970s, things had changed considerably. So the North American Soccer League, the first major national professional league we had in America, uh, launched in 1967, I believe. But it didn't really become popular until the mid-1970s when investors started bringing in big name players like Pelé and Beckenbauer uh, and Nashkins. Um, Gerd Muller and, and George Best and, and uh, you know, all these great players uh, from Europe and South America, and then it became popular, but it was a bit of a fad. So the league folded because it was a fad, because there wasn't really any foundation there, and because of the amount of money, the sheer volume or sheer amount of money that was being spent for these players, they just, um, in most cases, teams were not drawing very well. Now, certainly the New York Cosmos Occasionally, we're getting big crowds, but then even the New York Cosmos, on average, were not selling out the stadium. Um, the team might get 76,000 for, you know, the cup final, the soccer bowl, uh, but a regular season game might not, you might get 10,000 or 8,000 people. So they had a hard time uh, getting, um, getting people in the seats. So the league ultimately folded and then it folded. Teams started folding here and there. The league also expanded. Uh, rapidly in the 1970s. I think you had a number of teams, you had teams all over the country, uh, and it just became too much. So the league folded, but the good thing about the North American Soccer League is millions of Americans, million, millions of American kids started playing the sport, and parents started coaching. Um, those kids started playing in college. College programs started, uh, started up. Uh, college programs that existed started getting better. So more and more players, you have more immigration, um, more immigrants from Latin America, from the Caribbean, from Africa and Asia. These people started coming in and playing and the sport start, excuse me, the sport started becoming more and more popular. So that's a bit of a rebirth there. Um, the United States national team still couldn't get its act together. Uh, but in 1988, uh, the United States, the U S soccer federation was awarded the rights to host, uh, the world cup. And that was a, that was a big deal. And on the condition that the United States would um, would host a professional league, that 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 it would uh, it would create a league that would would be able to 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 keep it going, to keep the sport going, and it did so uh, in 1995. And then the league formally, in Major League Soccer, started to play in 1996. And here we could we could see two great players from Major League Soccer that have uh, changed the sport uh, for different ways, for different reasons. Uh, David Beckham s sold shirts, sold jerseys. Uh, David Beckham helped redesign the Los Angeles Galaxy crest. Um, the Los Angeles Galaxy was able to bring in a shirt sponsor and sell for a lot of money. So that certainly helped the league. Um, Landon Donovan, uh, the, the first maybe true American superstar. Of course, there were past American star. Uh, there were American stars in the past that did very well, but Landon Donovan was the first. Um, a star who had a wider appeal, uh, who achieved a little bit more consistently. And both of these players uh, did a lot for the game in America, and they helped uh, re, um, reinvigorate the sport. Of course, in 1990, uh, the United States, uh, the U.S. men's team qualified for the World Cup. And as I mentioned, they hosted the World Cup in 1994. And in 1994, the team reached the second round. And it was a very good team. And then four years later, the team uh, finished dead last at the tournament in the 1998 World Cup. 
So we saw uh, a dip. We saw, as uh, I interviewed Tal Ramos in the past, and he said, you know, the game, there's a lot of peaks and valleys with the game in, in this country. And uh, it seems like we go through a lot of valleys. Uh, occasionally, there's a great peak. And that was a valley in 1998. And then, of course, there was a big peak in 2002 um, when the U.S. team reached uh, the quarterfinals. So if you're interested in American soccer memorabilia and collecting it or valuing it, you need to follow the sport, follow the news, see what's happening with the U.S. teams, uh, the men's and the women's teams, the youth teams, and also follow Major League Soccer and the Women's Professional League here as well. You need to see what American players are doing overseas. You need to pay attention to uh, announcements and news. Um, the U.S., uh, Mexico and Canada will be uh, co-hosting, they will be hosting the World Cup in 2026, the Men's World Cup. That should be good. The women's team is playing in the World Cup this summer, the 2019 Women's World Cup. Pay attention and see what's going on there. Uh, and that's it. Just just watch the game, follow it. And it's, it's basically that simple. The next podcast, I will be talking about shirts, uh, signed shirts. I want to thank you for... Uh, taking the time to watch the podcast, and I look forward to doing the next one. Thank you.